the cloud. Okay, so we're now recording. So welcome to a session about polling at UNCG. Um, so I'm focusing today on free tools that are available at UNCG. I'm going to go over the why, um, and then we're really going to go into the tools, right? This is going to be a, you know, somewhat active, you know, session. You don't have to like turn your camera on and participate, but there's going to, of course, be a lot of polls. And then we're going to go into the back end of a lot of the polling systems. Um, so this is casual. Um, you know, these are the library instructional tech sessions where we just kind of play around with these tools. Um, but do know we get tons of questions about polling, um, academic ITCs, ITS. We were just talking about it in an academic ITC meeting today. So if you want to follow along, um, this does have links to a lot of the polls, the tools we're going to cover, um, you know, advice, articles, all the things, they're all right there um, for us to have. Okay, y'all know me, I'm Sam Harlow, here we are. Okay, so what I mean by polling is that anything that you send to an audience, whether it is for conference, for instruction, um, any kind you're doing a presentation, you're asking for audience participation, right? Um, so it could be as simple as kind of saying, what's your favorite color and having people um, answer it in the chat, right? But of course, what we're really looking at today are these tools that help us with that. So polling provides an ideal way to provide to both keep a class's attention and provide a reflective activity to move information into long term memory. These polls are a wonderful way to engage students or your audience members if you're at like a conference presentations in the material and keep their interest. Best of all, the results appear in real time so students can see changes as they come in. And it also can help for y'all and we're going to talk about this a little bit in terms of formative assessment right if we're trying to gauge audience participants like level of comfort what they want to cover today um, we're using that for formative assessment and that we can then flex and kind of move from there so um, when we're talking about polls and why they work you know i think that quote kind of summed it up well but the nice thing about polling in terms of accessibility in terms of engaging your audience is that most of the time they're used in these anonymous and low state ways right um, so it's a great way to kind of gauge your audience and uh, a lot of them are mobile friendly and embed in presentation tools. Um, sometimes, of course, um, you know, I know that like in uh, liaison work when I'm going to a class right there's always this battle of students having their mobile devices out, but this is a way to kind of say okay you have your mobile devices out let's use it to take these polls and kind of figure out where we're at what y'all want to learn today. So it's an easy and again low stake way to engage your learners right um, and it can be great for synchronous sessions it's kind of we've got, covered this in other sessions right but a lot of times when we're thinking through these sessions and you know how they flow in terms of lecture it's good to chunk it up right good to think about it in terms of like breaking checking in with your audience so in these ways again it's a way to kind of pull people out of chat make sure people are paying attention uh, again in a way that you're not making them necessarily turn their cameras on or um, turn their mics on if they don't feel comfortable, right? Um, and so again, even for different kind of learning preferences, right? If you don't want to talk in class, they can still participate in this way. So today, all the ones we're talking about are free or have free versions. We're going to talk about some tools at UNCG that do cost the students money, one in particular. Um, but for really what we're talking about today and what we'd want to use in our instruction or out at conferences or giving a presentation to a student group, anything like that, we're talking about free stuff. Um, so another thing that's nice about polls is that some of them, and we're going to talk about the tools that allow this and don't, allow you to keep the data, right? So you could see what are the, like if you ask a question like, what is your biggest uh, challenge when you're researching a topic on public health? Right, I'm the public health librarian. Then you could see if the, if evaluating sources is coming up over and over again every time you ask. Then maybe you just need to always include something, a little bit of something about evaluating sources. So it can be again a, not only a way to kind of gauge what you're going to teach, you know, how you teach, right, based on what's coming up on these polls, um, but also to um, improve, right? So um, you can use them, of course, as kind of assessment at the end. So here are some things that I use along with the polling tools that we're about to go over. Um, so I am, um, y'all can answer in the chat if you want me to go over any of them. I know some of us probably like use this stuff all the time. Um, but when we're talking about polls, we're talking about links or resources that we share, right? So we're dropping them in the chat, a link to a poll. We're like releasing them in the tool. They're embedded in the thing. Um, but some way in terms of these tools that can be nice is creating a Go link to some of these things. So Go links are basically UNCG's tiny URL. Um, so again, I, 
I don't know if y'all want me to say more about this. If you're not already using this, just let me know in the chat. Um, but it's just a way that you anyone can go to go.uncg.edu. You can log in. It also gives you analytics. So you can see how many times people are hitting your URLs, right? Um, I particularly use them with Google Forms, which is a polling tool we are going to talk about um, in a little bit. So speaking of Google, um, Google EDU is, of course, a great uh, resource, the Google Suite that we have here at UNCG. Um, so you can use the links to these polls, embed the polling tool right within other Google um, things, right? So this is a Google slide. So you're going to see I'm going to have a sample in here of how we're going to take a poll everywhere that's embedded within Google Slides, uh, but you could also have a reflective, you know, Google Doc with an editable link where students are in there and they can get links that way. Again, there's a lot, again, any way that makes it easier for your students, for your audience members to get to the links is great. So there's a lot of considerations when we're thinking through things at UNCG. Uh, there is something called click wrapping, click wrapped, um, which is these online tools. Um, so full disclosure, I did go to um, the legal counsel page where the click wrap information used to live and it has disappeared. Um, so I don't know what that means. Um, we did just get a whole new like legal counsel team, I think, here at UNCG. So maybe they're revamping it. Maybe it's going away. Uh, if you try to look in like past uh, blogs from academic ITCs about click wrapping, um, it's all gone. So again, stay tuned. Uh, but what click wrapping is, is that technically if the product is not approved by legal counsel here at UNCG or, um, you know, uh, goes through this process, Process, right, that we check the terms of agreements when you sign up for a free online tool, then it's not click wrapped. Um, so there are certain things that are click wrapped at UNCG and certain things that aren't. Not everything that we're covering today is click wrapped. The last thing I checked, um, and I'll try, I'll answer any questions about that. Um, but again, stay tuned. It seems like that stuff is changing. Um, so academic ITCs are also a great resource in terms of, um, you know, ask any questions about this stuff. They have workshops that are on workshop.uncg.edu. Um, so if you're working with a class and um, the faculty member that you're working with has questions or if you're taking a class, um, well, they don't help students. But if you're like teaching with someone or know an instructor, you know, you're an instructor of record in any of these departments, uh, you could talk to these um, ones. So if you have any questions about this, let me know. But they have a lot of information, workshops, et cetera, about that, as well as the UTLC. Um, I know probably a couple of y'all have heard this isn't um, secret information. UNCG Online's um, ITCs are, are moving over to the UTLC, so they will have some more um, instructional technology consultant support um, moving forward. Okay, so when you're looking at these free tools, and we're going to talk about it for each of the tools we're going to talk about today, there's a couple of things to consider, right, when you're looking at each of these polling free tools online. So the big thing I'm always looking about are, you know, since they're free online, right, with an email account, I set up an account, what are my limits? Because most of these tools have a paid for version, right, um, which means I'm not getting the full breadth of what they have to offer. So really understanding what you're getting in terms of the free version is important. And a lot of times that means audience limits, uh, question limits, right? You can't ask unlimited amount of questions. Sometimes it means you can't keep the data, right? The data like disappears the minute you leave the site, um, et cetera. Um, so again, you're really always thinking through that. And one thing I always do when I'm trying out a new tool, because we're talking about some like pretty established tools today, but I'm sure like next week there will be a new tool out there that could be great, um, that I'm always going to the like pay the pricing part of a free tool and I'm, I'm comparing right for zero dollars what do I get versus um, you know the institution account or creating a personal account. Um, if you really like something you are welcome to buy it with your own money or talk to your department head etc about if you could get a department account to things. Um, I think that does happen um, all the time, so if there's something that you really want uh, keep that in mind but always kind of know the difference right between pay for or not pay for. Um, and then, of course, this um, is going to go without saying, but I feel like I always have to say it in these sessions. Be sure you test your polling tool, right? Um, make sure you're testing it on a browser, on different browsers. It might work differently on Firefox than it does on um, Chrome. Ideally, you're testing it in a mobile device as well. There are add-ons where you can, um, you know, kind of act like you're on a mobile device when you're on a URL um, that I can talk about if y'all are interested. Um, and then test when you're not logged into your UNCG account, right? So like you want to try to go to a browser where you're not logged in and make sure it works. Because a lot of times your audience members might not go to UNCG and your students might not be logged into their UNCG account if they're taking it from their phone or on their laptop um, or Chromebook or anything like that. 
Okay, so that's kind of the nitty gritty. So here are the tools we're going to cover. Are there any questions before we uh, go into the actual tools? Okay, so here we go. I'm hearing a lot of silence. So I hope this just means everyone is doing great with what's going on so far. So the first one we're going to talk about um, is Google Forms. So in each of these slides, I have a link out to the actual tool. Um, so keep that in mind. You could go and play around with it yourself. Um, so I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with Google Forms, right? Um, I would assume so. Um, it's just like an easy to use form that we can create from our um, Google account from drive.google.com, right? That edu, I guess, for us, uh, but just through your Google Drive account. So here are some pros and cons. We're going to do this for each tool. So the pros of Google Forms are that they're free and easy to use. Um, they're with UNCG, you have no limits, right? There's no limits in terms of storage. Uh, you get to keep the data, right? And you can quickly go into your Google Form, right, and show the results. Uh, and a lot of times they show you visuals, right? Like the graphs, if it's a yes, no question. Um, so the cons are that you need to go back into the like how you collect response and make sure that the link is easy to share outside of UNCG. Um, even when you shorten the URL in a Google form, right, it's still kind of long and messy, right, a messy link. So using a go link, a go.uncg.u to create a link to these forms uh, for polling can be good. And then the design customization is limited, like you can't really make it look fancy um, or anything like that. They are pretty mobile friendly, um, if that is a concern that you have in terms of of the um con. yeah drive.uncg.edu thanks jenny can never like think of it on the spot okay so let's try out a google form um i'm gonna drop this in the um chat and y'all can pull it up um right uh if again if i was in class with the students i would tell students they are welcome to use their mobile devices um again i find with polling it's a good way to say go ahead use your phone don't care right um in that way um so y'all can start taking that. I tried to ask questions that people could actually take. So the nice thing about Google Forms, right, is that I'm sharing it with the class in Zoom. I'm in person, right? Maybe I have this on my screen in person and students are typing it into their phone. You give them a second, go out to here in Zoom. You have this easy to share link. You give people time to like take it. You can have any type of question, right? Um, you know, single choice, these kind of scales, all these different kinds of things. And then once you give your audience member a little bit of time for polling, you can click on the edit button because I'm logged into my UNCG account, right? And I can see the responses. So again, the nice thing about Google Form is live in class in a conference presentation, you can pull this up as people are taking it and it changes as people fill it out. Right. And you can see like most people have not uh, used polling when presenting at a conference or a class uh, to have. Right. And then you can see like how excited are you know, people are pumped. Yay. Someone is like, eh, I'm okay being here. That's fine. <laughs> um, and then, you know, what's something you hope is covered today? And then you can see again quickly and pivot. So sometimes I've used these in class and people are like, oh, I actually have a specific experience I want to talk about. And you can say, if you feel comfortable sharing, like this is a great time to share. Again, it gives you a lot of time for flexibility. Um, so um, here is the um, different types of things, right, in terms of how you share. So if you're ready to share a Google form, again, you can push send, get an email, get a link is what I usually do. You can shorten the URL. You could add this into Go Links, but note that if you want to share it outside of UNCG, it like just changed. Um, if this is confusing for you, um, you go to settings, responses, and then you need to change it to um, say it defaults to restrict users to UNCG, um, but you want to take this off if you're using it at a conference in particular or like a national webinar or anything like that. Yeah, it's so annoying now. They just changed it. So if you haven't used Google Forms in a couple months, um, note that this is how you do it now. It's very annoying. <laughs> yeah. It's like you get used to one way. Um, and not. And so again, this is how I use Google Forms and polling. So someone did ask here, um, just hoping to, uh, what are the best kinds of questions to ask in a poll format? Um, I don't have that covered, but at the end, we can kind of talk through that and get examples of that. 
Yeah, so Rachel says, I always turn it off even if I'm presenting to UNCG because it takes people forever to get logged in. Yes, um, I agree, Rachel. Like I um, I think used to just leave it on if I was going to a UNCG class because I was like, whatever. But then after a couple of times of trying that, I was like, this is a disaster. Um, so I just always turn it off. I make a form, I go into settings and I turn it off. I can't think of like a time, unless I was like polling just UNCG librarians about something through email or anything like that. Um, I might keep it on, but in terms of using it like this live in a synchronous session, I always turn it off. Okay, so are there any questions about using Google Forms for polling? Um, note that like a form, right, to me is different than a survey. That's different than polling, right? So to me, using Google Forms for polling means we're gauging our audience, we're engaging them about something, and then we're showing the live results um, by going to the response tab and getting it that way. Um, so that's what I would say a difference. If you were doing a survey for your research or for to the librarians or anything like that, that to me is different than polling. Um, so I use I use Google Forms in both ways, but this is how I use it for like polling in class or conference. So we just talked about this, but that's the biggest thing I see is changing that response collection um, to outside of UNCG. Um, and then make sure when you're doing a live poll that you're logged into your UNCG account so that you can quickly um, go here and show the results, right? That you're not having to do all that login and like double authentication. So what I do when I go to a conference or when I'm going to a class is I just get logged into my drive uh, so I can quickly go from all these things um, easily and show the results. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is Mentimeter. Um, again, the link to Mentimeter, if you've never used it before, is up here at the top. Um, so Mentimeters, here's some pros and cons. So the biggest pro to me of Mentimeter and why I've started using it um, exclusively really for polling in terms of class and conferences is that it does allow for unlimited users on your polls. So if you're doing trying to get a poll at like a national ACRL or ALA or like NCLA webinar that you're doing or a conference, you don't ever have to worry about like, oh, well, I somehow end up being presenting to like 300 people. Um, it doesn't matter. It takes hundreds of results. Um, there are many different question types and they um, it's a really nice interface right on the back end. It's really pretty easy to use. They guide you through the process on each question. It's very mobile friendly um, and really easy for students to use. And it's also anonymous. They don't have to create an account. They can easily access it from their phones. Um, and then they don't have to feel like they're being monitored, right? Sometimes I think with students with Google Forms, they feel like, oh, you're gonna be tracking my data somehow, right? So they might feel afraid to say like what they're afraid to learn or something they didn't like in the session. Uh, but with Minimeter, it really truly is um, anonymous. Um, so the cons of it is that the free version only allows for two slides and question types per poll, um, and I'll show you that on the back end. Uh, the way I get around that if I'm using tons of polling in an instruction session or for a conference is I just create multiple presentations, because there is no limit on presentations, or if there is, I haven't hit it yet, and I use it all the time. Um, if there is a limit on that somehow that I've missed, I would just go back in and delete the ones you don't need anymore, um, and I'm constantly reusing ones that I use, um, you know, if I'm asking the same question over over and over again, right? Like, have you ever taught an online class before or anything like that? So it is not technically UNCG click wrapped uh, approved last time I checked. Um, and you also need to create an account. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's totally understandable. Um, but um, just to be clear, you can do things like, you know, log into an account that is not uh, click wrapped at UNCG, but then you're on your own. You wouldn't want to contact UNCG, uh, ITS, right about millimeter you're just kind of you're trying it on your own and trying it that way you're you're assuming the risk yourself the terms of agreement okay so let's try millimeter one of the nice things about millimeter is that there's multiple ways to get to it so if i was in an in person class right i could tell students uh, use this QR code, right? Or you can go on your phone to www.menti.com and type in this code, 88083052. But it also links directly to the um, account. So you can go here and I can drop it in the chat. So y'all can access this whatever way you want on your phone, um, through that chat, um, anything like that, um, and try it that way. So. I'm now I'm going to go into Mentimeter. So y'all are seeing the interface on your end, right, where it's asking you the um, first question. And then this is my account, right? So here is, um, and I'm going to go over the back end stuff, but here's the presentation, and I'm going to click play. 
So as I can, y'all are going directly to the link, but also notice I can have this up and if students come in late or if they're taking a little bit more time, they can see here at the top that they can always enter at www.mincy.com and use the code 8808-3052. So this is one that I um, like to use in terms of um, polling, right? To kind of gauge the audience, right? When I'm thinking about polling, low stakes way to engage my audience members, I'm kind of trying to understand like what is their comfort level with whatever I'm about to teach on. So here are some questions that I'm asking y'all about like your comfort level with polling, um, right? Some of y'all are in the middle, like the majority of y'all are in the middle, right? An expert on polling and instruction or presentations, you, you kind of are in the middle, right? In terms of strongly agree, strongly disagree. Um, I hate having to take polls in long set live sessions. So some of y'all are, most of y'all are leaning towards strongly disagree. That's good since we're doing so many polls in live sessions and polls are a useful tool to engage your audience. A lot of y'all are agreeing. So again, of course, when I'm using this with like a library instruction class and um, anyone can say if they do it differently, right? I'm kind of in the, I'm saying stuff like, what is your experience level using library databases or what's your experience, you know, how experience, you know, do you feel like you're an expert on the library website um, on using, you know, uh, on researching for your subject and kind of gauging how comfortable they feel before I start a session. So the next question, if you're still on it, um, it should push you to this now that I've moved forward. Um, if you left, you can go back to www.minty.com and use the code or go back to that link I dropped in the chat. But what is a reservation or fear you have about using polls? Um, and this is an example of how Mentimeter does their open-ended questions, right? And you can um, see how it will trickle in as people answer. So yeah, like you can see how it comes up anonymously. It's a nice, I think, interface of its scales. This is the question type that I use the most in Mentimeter, right? Because it like quickly... Um, you know, shows it, it's anonymous. The question that I ask the most in my library information literacy instruction sessions are what is the fear or challenge you face when you are researching? And then get, if they, like most of them say citations, then I know that I'm gonna like definitely try to save enough time for citations. Um, so that kind of thing. So I think it's important too to address your poll, you know, your polls. So like here I'm asking, like, what are some fears y'all have? So y'all are saying, you know, negative feedback. Yes, that's real. <laughs> I try to save stuff where I'm asking for feedback in terms of like negativity, like where they might say that they hated my instruction session towards the end so that they feel comfortable putting that stuff in there. And then I can assess it later alone in my office so that if I have to be upset about it, I can be upset by myself. Um, so that's one thing if, if you're kind of afraid of negative feedback. Um, so someone mentioned that people will get stuck on the tech and not participate. Yes. So one thing, and we're going to talk about accessibility and polling at the end. But one thing is that like, you can't really, it's hard to require these low stake polls, like require them, right? Um, and then, so if you're in a class with like, or a conference presentation with like 20 people, but you're only getting like five responses, you know, to me, I can't tell anyone how to feel, of course, but like, I think it's just important to move on, right? Because like some people are just never going to feel comfortable doing polls. Some people are just like, I'm here just to like hang out. I don't want to do this. And that's okay. Because we all have different ways that we learn and different ways that we engage in sessions. So yeah, audience not being able to assess it and having to deal with it. Yes, hopefully a lot of like you seeing it live today uh, will help you all get over that as well. Yeah, the sites often give me trouble on the back end. So yeah, I think again, this is really important to again, demo your stuff, get comfortable with it. I like seeing them in action. So hopefully today y'all seeing a lot of these tools and how they can work are good. Okay, so now I'm going to show you all what Mentimeter looks on the back end so that you can kind of understand how it works if you want to use these for instruction. So y'all went from the front end, right? But I'm logged into my account. So I can go to my presentations and you can see here all my presentations, right? Um, that I've done. So here's an example of a class I went to. And this is a great example, right? Where there was probably about like 25 people in the class, but 12 people filled out what I asked them, which is totally okay. That's an example of like, you're never gonna get full participation. Um, so if you want to, it, it does keep your data, 
right? So if you wanted to look at the results of something after it happened, uh, you can go in here and see what happened. So here's an example of a common question I ask, what is the biggest challenge you face when researching topics in parks and records for um, community and therapeutic recreation? And again, see, people are constantly saying credible sources. <laughs> so um, again, you can download results if that's something that you wanted to do an assessment project over time. Um, and you can reuse content. So if I wanted to reset results, right? Um, and if I was teaching this say in fall 2022 or this summer, I could reset results and use the same thing and it will just give me a new code. Um, so something to keep in mind about Mentimeter, um, it's really easy. They're called presentations. The polls are called presentations. So if I wanted to make a new one, I could just say create presentation, title it, and now here it's how it looks. So it gives you all the popular question types. Um, it does do quizzing as well and slides. That's why it's called presentations, but I only use Mentimeter for questions, polling. Um, so multiple choice, word cloud, open-ended, scales, ranking, and Q&A is the question types they allow. Um, if you hover over the questions, they'll explain to you what is happening there. Um, Oh, so Rachel asked um, Mentimeter used to limit responses of people who use swear words. Um, I don't know. I've never um, seen swear word. Now that I'm thinking about it, I've never seen like, you know, like something like boobs, which I have seen on some point um, or anything like that. So maybe it does and it like just cuts them out. Interesting. I feel like I'm going to test this um, another time. Not today. Hi, I can, if I can interrupt, yes. they have a profanity filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, Rachel, you can turn totally it on right. and off. You can turn it on and off, and then you can select all these different languages. So if you're like, oh, I'm afraid people are going to be swearing in Croatian, you can specify. Wow, I, I think I just Padlet, never turned that on. Yeah, I've never turned it on either. Padlet has that, which I have turned on. Yeah, on I was, I've seen yeah. it happen in Padlet, so maybe I would turn it on. That's funny. Um. Okay, so like, let's say I want an open ended question. Um, it go then pops me into content. You just type your question here, um, right? Like it just, I just picked one from one I've used before, right? You can drop an image if you want. Um, you can change the style. And if you hover above it, it shows you what style. Um, I always do the speech bubbles, but um, I've seen it done other ways. I think it's a lot of different nice options. Um, you can let participants submit multiple times um, and you can customize through here. Um, but of course, right, like you're not gonna get all the examples. So sometimes it might block you, right? It might say pay extra money to get this feature. Um, so the big thing about Mentimeter that I've noticed, and again, I know Rachel and um, Jenny use this a lot, so feel free to uh, jump in, is that you when to share it, right, like, you know, they might, you can go from here, but you also, if you want to get a link, um, note that it does um, default to expire in two days. So if you make it like well ahead of a um, instruction session or a conference session, um, you can, um, you know, expand it or um, expand it out to seven days, um, but beyond seven days, you have to have premium. Uh, so what I do is I just typically end up going in a couple days before my instruction session and make sure this is up to date. Um, if it's not, you can, um, of course, uh, get a new link and code, right? Like if you're expanding it out, it will send you a new code and then you'll just start it again. Uh, so just be cautious of that. Um, if you want the QR code, right, you can, um, you know, uh, download it from here as well from download QR. Um, I usually just make a copy of the QR code and put it in my presentation. Um, it also gives you options for um, embedding it. If you wanted to do that within a LibGuide or something like that, you do get that from the free um, one. And then again, anytime you see this star, right, it's saying that this is actually a pay for feature. So adding collaborators you can't do for free. So that's again, the biggest thing I've seen with Mentimeter is that two day thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what Jenny said. I have literally never been totally prepared for a class or presentation more than seven. This did happen to um, me once uh, at a conference where I guess I had just made the slides, you know, well before I like flew out to the conference. So again, just like the day of anything, I would recommend testing it. Uh, again, test, test, test all this stuff to make, make sure you feel comfortable. Um, and then also be prepared to like abandon it. If it gets weird at all, just say, never mind, we're, we're letting this go. Are there any questions about Mentimeter on the back end or about how it looked for y'all on your end? 
Yeah, so Rachel said, test the specific computer you're on. It failed me in 177A yesterday. Yes, I was just thinking how I need to go to 177A for a Zotero workshop and make sure everything's working. So yeah, if you can test, like if you're going to a conference, if you could get there like 10 minutes early and test it out um, in the actual place you're in too, that's also useful, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to backhand, but okay. So that was Mentimeter. So the next thing we're going to talk about is poll everywhere. Um, full disclosure, now that I have found Mentimeter and I feel really comfortable with Mentimeter, because I think part of polling is like finding a tool that you feel really comfortable with, um, is that I usually use Mentimeter. So I have not used poll everywhere in a while, um, right? Because I have just gotten used to my Mentimeter interface and how it works and how mobile friendly it is. Students usually really love it. Um, I get to see the data afterwards. Again, I like it. Yeah, it's replaced it for me too, Jenny. But here's Poll Everywhere. I wanted to show it and talk about the differences. Um, where, yeah, and so Jenny said I had trouble at several conferences, but I do think it's gotten better. So yeah, we're going to talk about the issues that I've usually seen with Poll Everywhere. So the pros of Poll Everywhere is that it's mobile friendly, um, that it work, it has an add-on feature where it embeds within Google Slide, and that's how we're going to try it. Um, but um, it is nice because it's free, but only up to 50 people, right? So the con is the 50 people thing. Um, I have seen in ACRL, ALA webinars, NCLA, that people try to use Poll Everywhere and they've tested it, right? But they haven't tested it with more than 50 people. And some of these like big national webinars, right? Or even like a large lecture class, right? The 50 people limit's a huge deal. It just shuts it down. So the way that works is that the minute 50 people have done it, it just starts saying no one else can take it. So it can be awkward. People usually complain in the chat. Um, and then, you know, like Jenny was saying in the chat, like, like it's interface has gotten a lot better, but you just have to be careful and check it, right? Um, I will say I went into the back end. It's the first time I've been into the back end for years for this presentation. And I found it like harder to like use than Mentimeter, but we're going to go in the back end and maybe you'll disagree with me. Again, this might be like my Mentimeter bias shining through at this point. Um, but it was like harder for me to like get used to it um, in those ways. So here's a poll everywhere. Let's take it. So you need to go on your phone or your computer to uh, poll.ev.com slash Samantha Harl 465. Or you can text. This does have a text feature, right? Um, so if you're going through text, you can text Samantha H A R L 465 to 37607 once join. And then you would put your answer, right? A, B, C to the question. Um, do you like the way that pull everywhere displays on your screen? Yes, no, maybe. Right, I see people are taking it. So y'all are figuring it out. Um, I always find the ones where you have to text something kind of confusing to me. Cause I'm like, so am I texting 37607? Um, which is right, but like, I don't know. It just always is confusing to me, but yeah. So people are taking it. And it shows you this percent and you can see it happens in live time and see I didn't have to ever even leave my screen. Um, this is all really nice features, I think. Um, so again, though it's not a tool I use all the time, I think this is nice, particularly for these kind of multiple choice questions uh, where the graph is showing in real time um, in this way. So someone said, the Jenny said the link won't work for you. I don't know. I mean, some people are in here. It's a lot to type in. Yes. Um, and there might be a way to clean up the links. I couldn't find it when I was in the back end the other day. Um, but here we are. Yeah. So Jeremy said, I tried it texting. It took me a few attempts, LOL. So that's why, like, I have some, I don't know if it's like a mental block, if it's like showing my age. I'm an elderly millennial, um, but like I have a really hard time with these kind of texting ones. It just takes me a while. I'm like you, Jeremy. I, it just always takes me a little bit to um, do it. So yeah. Well, y'all saw this. Uh, thank you for filling it out. Um, I'm going to show y'all now how it looks on the back end. Um, so we were in a trial of poll everywhere at UNCG. Um, so I have an account through them. And again, look, here's the pricing if you wanted to go that way. Um, right, I'm logged in right now. Um, but to see the stuff, you can just, I guess, get started. Let's, yeah. So they call theirs, you know, Mentimeter called their stuff presentations. Uh, they called theirs activities. Um, and then I have this 
steady URL right um, here and all my activities go into here. So I guess if I wanted to edit the URL, I would do so here. Um, but see, I think with the free account, you can't do it, right? Yeah, you have to get premium. So again, example. So that's why, again, the URL is not very friendly. But if you paid money, they allow you to create a very friendly, easy to use URL. So that's how it works. You have the steady URL, right? So if I create an activity, right, it gives me all the same stuff we've seen, right? Open-ended Q&A, word cloud. So like, let's do a word cloud and like, what's your favorite color? And then you create, and then it adds on to what you already have, see? So if y'all were there, right, it would open up. Um, so then you can activate up here on the upper right. Um, and then you can present straight from here as well. Um, so that's how it works, right? So if you're on there, I don't know if like y'all are on the screen that just sh showed up, um, but that's how it works on the back end. So that's how Poll Everywhere works. So in terms of adding it to Google Slide, if you really liked that feature, because um, I do like that feature, I think that's nice that you can just be in a Google Slide and have it all happen right there. I think that's, I think that's lovely. Um, it's an add-on. So you would need to find the add-on, right, and then add it. So once you do that, here is where it shows up, Poll Everywhere. Um, and then you can um, create a new one straight from here, or you can insert one that you've already created. So if I'm inserting that color one, right, I can just go here, insert the slide, and then it takes a little bit. When I did this yesterday, I actually had to do it twice. Um, and then notice here, it gives you a QR code and all the stuff um, from here. So that's how Pull Everywhere works. And again, I like that it has that Google Slide feature, um, but I don't like that it, uh, it's like harder to use and it took me a little bit to figure out on the back end. Are there any questions, concerns, comments? Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna talk to you all about is Canvas. Um, so Canvas is UNCG's learning management system. And we, at this moment, as far as I know, I did some research yesterday, do not have a polling integration that is fully poll polling, right? But we do have some options if you were to wanna poll within a class within Canvas. Um, so one of them is a discussion board. So if you're in a discussion board in Canvas, you can change the settings and allow for students to like post and then say, push the most liked post to the top. That is a gentle poll that you can do asynchronously um, within a Canvas course. And again, students typically like, like Canvas, know how to use Canvas in my experience at UNCG. Um, so that can be a way to do that asynchronously. I just hit 10,000 steps, moving my hands a lot. Yay me. Um, so Polls for Canvas is an app that allows you to poll within a course. We had this years ago, uh, but from the research I did yesterday, I don't think we have it anymore. <laughs> so this link takes you to an older um, blog post from an academic ITC about how it works. Um, but again, I don't think we have it. So if we get it back, I'll let y'all know, but this app at least shows you what it is. But what the future really of Canvas is and what can, how Canvas works with these like tools, right? Like these other tools outside of Canvas is something called LTI, which stands for Learning Technology Interoptability, which basically is a way that apps integrate with um, Canvas. So for example, Poll Everywhere has an app, right? That integrates with Canvas. Mentimeter has an app. But the way a lot of these um, apps, these integrations work within Canvas is that your institution has to buy into the institutional account in terms of licensing for it to work. So UNCG, because we have Google Forms um, and because we pay for a lot of different stuff, like we have Microsoft and Google, you know, a lot of universities don't do this. We do not currently have a institutional subscription to any of the tools I'm covering today. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, but one thing that does work within Canvas is something called iClicker. So iClicker are that students buy a like polling device. It's like a clicker right, that they can point at the screen and answer questions. Um, it allows you to keep the data and it integrates within Canvas and you can even allow it to go for like grading, right, like participation grade or anything like that. Or even like if it's a quiz on the screen that you're all taking together, we see the live results. I don't know, it all works that way. 
iClicker does cost UNCG ITS money and it does cost students money. Students have to buy the clicking device the same way they would buy like a textbook. So if you ever work with a class that says they use iClicker, that means the students have bought a device. In my antidotal experience with this, students hate this. <laughs> um, and I never use it when I go into classes. I do not assume it happens. Um, students, you know, like we all know, right, don't want to buy textbooks. So why would they want to buy a clicker that they're only going to use for like a bio class or whatever? Um, so keep that in mind. Yeah, when you can just use your phone. So yeah, usually when I go into a class and I use Mentimeter and the students see that they could just do that on their phone, they actually kind of get mad at their teacher because they're like, are you kidding me? You made me buy iClicker and this lady's doing it for free <laughs> um, on my phone. I can just access my phone. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, I personally, as a librarian, do not like to engage in iClicker. I'm like, I just don't, I like to pretend like it doesn't exist. But today we are talking about polling at UNCG. So I thought I would talk about it so that y'all are aware, right, that it exists in case you go to a class and you see students have this, that, that's what it is. It's called iClicker. Um, so this link here um, takes you to a ITS's page on iClicker and how it works in case you're interested. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Um, you know, uh, old fashioned ways to pull. Yeah. So here's a screenshot of um, what you can change your discussion to allow for liking. So you're just going to go into the settings when you create a discussion in Canvas, allow liking and then say sort by likes. So if you wanted to say something like, you know, say your favorite color and then like someone who has your favorite color or whatever, then it would push all the all the favorite colors up to the top. Okay, so now we're going to do a zoom poll. Y'all ready? Let's do it. So before I do that, here's some pros and cons. Um, zoom polls are built into Zoom, so that's nice. They just show up and then they're there. Um, it easily stores and shares the results, and it's all through your uncg.zoom.us account. So I'm going to go in there and show you how to do it. And it projects well within Zoom. You don't have to leave. You don't have to get a device, right? It's kind of like a more old-fashioned because it just all happens within the interface you're already on. Um, so the cons are that there's a limit in questions. You can only do um, like basically multiple choice and then single choice, multiple choice, or like check boxes. That's it. There's no option for open-ended scaling. Um, a lot of what these fancy or apps, right? Like even Mentimeter and Pull Everywhere have, there's no options for that. Um, no word cloud. It's just, again, basically multiple choice or single choice. Um, and so uh, the host has to set it up. So if, um, let's say Jenny had created this Zoom session for me, and then um, I wanted to poll at the last minute, can't happen. Uh, that has to happen on the back end, right? Um, so they're dependent upon like time, right? Like you have to be able to set it up on the back end ahead of time. You can't really do them on the fly um, the same way necessarily as other ones um, in terms of setting them up. Okay, so I'm gonna do a poll. Let's do it. I'm launching it. So y'all should see a poll that's come up. The question is, how long have you worked at UNCG libraries? Um, this is the kind of questions you can ask in Zoom, right? Again, these multiple choice single answers like this. So you can see that all five of y'all, you know, have answered in this way, 100% participated. So once I've seen that, I can end the poll and then I can share results. Um, right, so y'all should be seeing the results that um, most of y'all in here are under five years. So that's how it works. So now I'm going to show you all how it looks within um, the back end of Zoom. Um, right, so if you log in to uncg.zoom.us, this is where you access your settings in Zoom on the back end. So even if you create a Zoom in your calendar, um, through a calendar integration, through Canvas, anything like that. If it's somehow connected to your account, this is where they show up. Um, so you're going to click sign in, and then here are all the meetings I'm a part of. Um, you can see I am in one now, live, right? Um, you can see the ones I have coming up. So you can only, you know, create polls for ones that you created the meetings for. You can't do it for other stuff. Um, but like, here's a meeting I have, right, with an LIS student. If I want to create a poll, you click on it. And then you're going to scroll down and then at the very bottom you can see poll and then you can say create and then you can title the question and then again you see it's only single choice multiple choice or multiple choice like multiple choices within you can do multiple check boxes you can do as many questions as you want i think but those are your question type 
I think it does save the data on the back end. Um, I don't use this very often, but I'll let you know after this if it's like, you know, in my meeting recording as well. Any questions about Zoom polls? Do y'all think you would use it? I never use it just because I, again, I like, I think it's like you kind of get into the way I always use Google Forms and Mintimeter. Um, but I've seen the, the Zoom polls be used a lot in like national conferences at the beginning. Yeah, I, I was going to say my problem is always remembering the steps. Like, again, to me, like Mentimeter and Google Forms, because I use them so often, it's just kind of part of my workflow. But every time I've tried to use these, I like have to remember, okay, I got to go into my account on the website and create it. And it has to be done before I open the session. Um, yeah, and, I keep thinking yeah. that like, you know, Zoom does updates all the time. And I keep thinking we're going to get an update where you could like more easily create polls on the fly, <laughs> you know, because you can't just like create them in your um, class, right? Um, but anyway, it's weird. So yeah, I don't use it very often, but I think I could see using it like for a conference, like a virtual conference, let's say if I'm like, well, like if like they, if they were like offering to set it up for me. Yeah, so then Rachel pointed out, I have seen them go wrong. So I guess it scared me a lot. So like, that's a big thing I hear when I do any kind of training like this is they're like, I've seen it go wrong like once and therefore I'm never <laughs> using it. So again, I think a lot of pulleys that you need to feel comfortable with it. So if you really don't feel comfortable with any of these tools for whatever reason, uh, I would say avoid it. Luckily you have other options. Um, yeah, and like, oh, and like to me, the big issue with it is like it only has multiple choice questions, and I very rarely use that. I usually am using, like Jenny said, the open ended questions. Like, what do you want to learn today? That's a big one I use at like conferences, right? So, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not going to cover this in detail because, like, I'm going to be real with y'all. I tried to log into my account that I have not logged into for in a while, and I had so many failed attempts that it like blocked me. <laughs> Um, and also I have found this is like actually a little bit harder and uh, weirder to set up in terms of the teacher aspect and then how your students um, do it. So once you get used to it, right, it does work well. I think, Jenny, weren't you using it a lot for a while? Um, but I am going to quickly cover it in case it ever comes up or you see it. So this link does take you out to Socrative, which is a polling tool. Um, and then here's a video. I'm not going to like um, make you all watch. It's like a six minute video, but it goes over like how you set it up and then how you share it with your students. Uh, but basically you have to create a URL and then it, and then you have to make sure there's like a teacher view and a student view. And then like the way you access the accounts are really different. So I have a link at the end that actually goes through step-by-step -step instructions of how this works. If you're a more of a textual person than a video person. Um, yeah. But it does have really nice open ended and it scales and it's anonymous so very similar to Mentimeter it doesn't have an audience limit. Um, but again, once I found Mentimeter and how easy it was used and how mobile friendly it is and how students really like were using it a lot better I thought I started using that. So this is here if y'all want to know that i'm not gonna again i'm not gonna make y'all watch this. Okay, so there's of course many more. Um, I'm gonna quickly go over a couple, um, but hopefully you just saw from me like demoing them. I wanted to really show you how it looked on the user end, but also on the back end. Um, but make sure that you're really researching the tool that you feel comfortable with it, right? I mean, I think we've kind of seen that from the chat, from people talking in the session, right? You just wanna make sure you feel comfortable with whatever tool you're using. So test it out, um, ask a friend, right? What they recommend um, and test it out. Like, you know, I usually like, I might send it to, um, um, ROI, right, and say like, hey, can y'all test this and make sure it's working, um, that kind of thing. So test it at home. So what about accessibility, right? Like how does this all work in terms of there? Um, the big thing is that you want to make sure that you're testing it in different browsers and on your phone. Um, you definitely want all of these to be mobile friendly, which the ones I've gone over today, they really are. Um, I think, you know, with HTML5 and how that's kind of progressed, I really haven't seen any many major issues, but the most accessible thing you can do with polls in terms of conference and classes is not require them, um, not grade them, um, and uh, just have it be a low stakes thing to engage your audience. But if people don't want to use them or if they're having trouble with it, like say move on quickly from it. 
Okay, so some other ones that I just don't have time to cover, but here they are, are um, something called Answer Garden. These are simple open answer question displays like a word cloud, um, no account required. Um, so this is how it looks, right? Um, you just go here. Um, here's the demo of how it looks, right? Um, it's just like a little quick word cloud in that way. It's really easy to use. It also embeds really well. I've used them within LibGuides or websites. Um, and so maybe like you're just asking something again, like what's a keyword you could use on this research question or anything like this? They're, they're really nice for that kind of simple word cloud, no login required. You just go in here and make one real fast. It has clean URLs. So Slido is for live Q and A's. Um, it does allow you to have up to a thousand participants. Um, so this is good for like national conferences um, where you maybe think that there's going to be tons of people answering. That's usually where I've seen these used at like ALA or something where you're like thinking maybe there would be tons of people participating. Um, so Plickers, someone talked about like raising your hand. Um, so Plickers is kind of a response for that. It was made um, for a K-12 environment. So there is a set of Plickers at the School of Education Teaching Resource Center if you wanted to play around with them. Um, but Plickers is um, you print out cards, right? Um, and then you can laminate them and then you distribute them to your students. And then when you're asking questions like, you know, right, they would hold up um, what they think is the right answer. And then you take your app, your Plicker app, and you go like this over the room. And then that's it. That's your, that, and then you would then immediately display, you know, how many of them said what answer. Um, it's kind of cool. Again, it's really meant for a K-12 environment where you don't want them using their phones, right? Um, but you want them to quickly answer these questions. Um, so if you go here, you can see how it works. They have, you know, video. So you can see here, like see people on the eye holding up the card here. Um, and I don't think y'all are hearing it, but see, this is like how it looks. Um, see how they're holding up their things, right? And then she just scans the room with her iPad and it will show you in live time, um, you know, their results. So it's again, it's really a K-12 setting. But it's pretty cool if you're interested in that. It's kind of an old school way to be more technology friendly. So y'all, I mean, if y'all have any questions about that, let me know. But um, again, um, I would say if you have any questions, you should talk to Laurie Sands in the Teaching Resource Center. They have a couple of sets over there that you can play around with. And are there others? Are there others that y'all use that I didn't cover? Um, anything that I missed? Probably. Oh, Rachel said Kahoot. I for, totally forgot about Kahoot. I'm going to add Kahoot on here. Sorry. Yes. So we have a premium account. Y'all have seen Kahoot a lot in those like library, um, you know, trivia sessions. Uh, Rachel and, and team Patrick, et cetera, use it there. Um, it's nice. The only issue I've ever had with Kahoot in terms of live sessions is the music. Um, did they fix that? I haven't used Kahoot in a while. I mean, you, you have to, sh if you are doing it, you have to share your sound, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't used sound in a while. Yeah. So if you want the sound, to, like, that's the thing, I guess I'm used to like when I was doing it in person in classes, um, you know, they would, uh, the music would like blare. <laughs> Um, and then Rachel also points out we also have small whiteboards that people can use to write responses and hold them up. Yes, whiteboards. I'm gonna add Kahoot onto here now. I just totally, I totally forgot about Kahoot. I do like Kahoot. Anything else that I missed? I find that students find Kahoot really fun. Like every time I use a Kahoot in class, they're like, ooh, because there's like a competition game element to Kahoot. Um, where you keep scores, there's a winner, you know, they time it, you know, so I, I do, I, I like Kahoot. Well, here's some more kind of resources um, 
for later. Um, so like there's a guide here at UNCG. Um, Poll Everywhere ironically has a table that compares all the popular polling tools, most of the ones we covered today. Um, and like what, you know, in terms of audience limits, settings, things like that. Um, here is a kind of like teaching and learning center from some university on active polling techniques. And here's the page for iClicker at UNCG if you wanna learn more about, um, you know, the ITS supported one. And that's it with six minutes to spare. Questions, concerns. Good. So Sean said that he didn't know about most of these options. Good. That's the point. I'm trying to uh, talk through it all. So yeah, I'm sure Jenny and Rachel probably um, knew about a lot of these, but uh, thanks for coming and uh, helping I me. Like, I like the way you did this, though. It made me think about different ways um, that I might use them because I get pretty stuck in the same kinds of questions. Um, plus, your slideshow was so cute. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, I think with like, pull, I actually like, you know, enjoy doing prepping for this because I was like man I haven't like touched poll everywhere in a while so it made me feel good to be like okay like things have changed I like these things about it um and like you know like to try different things um think through what data I could use that was something too where I was like oh which of these can I go back and look at what questions like worked and didn't work um a nice, another nice thing about these is like you know in this kind of like hybrid UNCG um you know in terms of instructional technology is pushing hybrid a lot right now um, and this, all of these can work um, online, as you see in Zoom, right? But they can also work if you're like in a classroom, right? With like a Go link or these quick ways they can get on their mobile phone. Um, so yeah, I think it's good. It's a good time to be polling <laughs> your students. Um, and I've been going to in class. I've been going in person and um, doing Zoom sessions with students. And I, I have very rarely had them like. Uh, you know, uh, get upset about having to take a poll. Usually they're like, okay, cool. And like, usually I get about a little bit over half participation. I don't know what y'all are getting right now. Um, and conferences, usually people are um, like very excited to take a poll because they're so used to just being kind of like lectured, right? At these conferences that, you know, they're like, okay, cool, I get a little break. So again, it could be a good way to kind of break up your session. Also assessment, but that's a whole different topic that, um, I was, I was just going to mention that um, I was really nervous about using Mentimeter, even though it said it didn't have a limit. I was doing a webinar that ended up having a lot of people um, attend, and I had like 200 and some responses on one Mentimeter, and it was like completely fine. Yeah. I just kept waiting for it to break. I was yeah. like, it's not going to be able to handle this volume of information. Yeah. I manage um, the, like, help moderate those ACRL ULS webinars, um, which typically have around 300 to 600 participants. Um, and that is how I first figured out that Poll Everywhere problem, right, um, is that a couple people tried to use it, and it just would, like, shut down. People got angry in the chat. Um, this was like pre pandemic where I feel like people weren't as like flexible online they were like things must work or I'm mad. Um, and uh, that was where I learned about that limit hardcore. Um, so we have started actually recommending Mentimeter because of what you said Jenny right like we have found that just quickly like we'll take in hundreds of results. Um, if you use anything like Google for Google um, Docs, there are actual limits on that. That's why I didn't even cover that, because to me, that's not polling. That's um, collaborative documents. Um, so that's why I would actually recommend Google Forms um, if you're doing like polling um, with the Google Apps the way we demoed it today. So thanks you all for coming. I'm sure many people have a three o'clock meeting. Um, the recording will be on the website. Let me know if you all think of other stuff about library instructional technology. Um, I'm always looking for uh, topics, so yay. <laughs> so see you all soon. Bye.